Thank you everybody for coming today. It's my uh, pleasure to be here representing uh, Dr. Jones, Peter Jones, who unfortunately was unable to make it, <clears throat> but he sends his best wishes and, uh, and his regrets. I was told to uh, put the, the disclosure slides up, but not to speak about them, so I won't. And so, uh, broadly speaking, so the title of the slide of the presentation is just a little bit misleading. We are going to speak about the health economic impact of increased dietary fiber increase uh, intake, but more broadly the presentation is about the research program that we have at the Richardson Center for Functional Foods and Nutraceuticals with respect to nutrition economics. So I'll try to go through the slides uh, quickly until we get to the point that does relate to the topic of the presentation. but. I think it'll be instructive to provide you with an overview of the general research methodology which we've now uh, implemented a number of times. So of course, uh, healthcare expenditures being a very considerable proportion of the public purse here in Canada. So many of you will be visiting from abroad or from the US or other places where healthcare is financed in a different way. So very broadly speaking, I would say that uh, our interest in the research is to acknowledge that uh, public health care expenditures are extremely high, as we'll see in the ensuing slides, and that it is in everyone's interest to look for constructive ways to uh, reduce uh, these expenditures. We're now talking about uh, more than 50% of public budgets, so uh, health care expenditures are uh, quite a significant concern for every taxpayer as well as, of course, every individual from their per personal health standpoint. We see uh, the incidence of diabetes is very high in Canada and worldwide. We see that cardiovascular disease, which has been the focus of a, a good deal of our research, uh, is a very costly uh, disease as well. So worldwide looking at uh, more than a trillion dollars predicted by 2030. I want to spend too much time here, but uh, Canada actually doing a little better than some countries uh, in terms of percentage of GDP spent on healthcare. However, it is entirely public funded, which is not the model uh, worldwide. Uh, showing that even though what we would call nominal healthcare costs in the in the darker shaded uh, boxes have uh, have gone up considerably, even in real terms. So in constant 1997 dollars, we see that. Uh, in increasing costs. So it's not just that, that services are becoming more expensive, they're also increasing uh, over time. And that is really the threatening part of the entire equation is with an aging population and a percentage of the population um, in, in certain demographic groups that's, uh, that are very large consumers of health care, it's uh, a troubling pattern and one that is uh, worthy of being addressed, which is what we're hoping to do in our research. So just a few more statistics on uh, diet, starting with diabetes, looking at Canada uh, of, uh, of uh, associated healthcare expenditures of 17 billion by 2020, which is a big number, of course. We see uh, cardiovascular disease, CVD, being uh, an important consumer of healthcare budgets as well. And it is, uh, it is an ongoing issue. So switching now to the approach, the potential approach to it. So of course, nutrition uh, eating patterns are a very important way to deal with these things. We know people don't eat well uh, all the time. Many, of, many people do, probably most of the people in this room do, but it is uh, a huge public health issue. Nutrition is one of the most obvious and most effective ways to address poor health. Uh, one of my research interests is uh, ass assessing how people estimating how people assess and discount their future health state. So people do things that are bad for them every single day. The problem is your health gets very incrementally worse. Uh, you could take somebody who's eating pattern today. In fact, I'm involved in a little bit of nutrigenomic research at the University of Manitoba, where we're trying to uh, get more reliable predictors of future health states. Even so, people look at a future health state, they could even look at their family history and say, wow, I've got all this diabetes or I've got all this heart disease in my family and I know that, that 
this could be a problem for me when I'm 60 like it was for my dad or my mom or my grandma or my grandpa or my uncles or aunts and I'm still going to pop open that bag of chips or that uh, bottle of coke because that's so far away when I'm 35 or in my case 42. So it is, uh, it is that, that's one of the things I'd like to explore more as to how, how people make those decisions, how they discount those future health states. So it's an interesting avenue, one that we haven't explored uh, too greatly yet, but uh, that lies down the road. So some, uh, some more statistics that you see, just again, underscoring the point that uh, this is a major area. Nutrition economics, I'm not entirely comfortable with, uh, with the development by nutritionists, I have to say, of a new, uh, a new stream in my field, but it does fit the bill. It's a little bit different than health economics, and it does, I, be, I honestly believe, uh, contain a great deal of potential for the future in terms of cost savings. So again, uh, just a little bit of a, a broad overview of some of the stuff that, and the way that we're thinking at the Richardson Center for Functional Foods and Nutraceuticals at the University of Manitoba. Uh, just a little bit of a description of how we have the marriage of these two fields of study. Uh, there was a different, uh, a different quote in here, but I decided to cite myself. Um, this definition could be found only in my head. So uh, I had personal communication with myself this morning as I went through this slide deck and came up with this, uh, with this definition. Explores the relationships between food, nutrition, disease, healthcare states, and the financial dimensions thereof. So that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> I like it better that, that, than what was on the slide before. So a little bit more about the thinking behind uh, what we call nutrition economics, <clears throat> I think uh, fits fairly well with what I've, uh, I've just introduced to you. How do we measure these benefits? So we actually had a paper in, I'll uh, just give you the citation there. This was in Nutrition Reviews back in 2012, uh, principally written by uh, the lead author there, Colin Giles, uh, myself, and Peter Jones. And so, uh, here we look, uh, we'll go back just for a second to the methodologies, which some of you will be familiar with. I don't want to spend too much time on them, but the paper that I cite uh, there has uh, a pretty incisive, uh, definitive overview of the work in the field. And so the paper's been cited a number of times. It looks at the different authors who have undertaken cost-benefit analyses, cost-effective analyses. Our chosen method to approach this uh, this line of research has been cost of il illness analyses. There are other boutique approaches that make sense. They're often uh, usually done by economists and so haven't been that well known in the nutrition literature, although there have been forays into that literature as well. So our method has been COI at the bottom, cost of illness analysis that measures the direct and indirect costs of a specific disease. So again, the, uh, <clears throat> the slide there shows the the citation, which can be found at your leisure if you're interested, just picking a couple of uh, a couple of the papers that we cite. There were um, several dozen that we looked at, identified, and explored, and categorized, uh, taxonomized, I guess, in the paper in nutrition reviews. There's just a couple, one by Dahl et al. from 2009, and uh, had another one there, but I lost it. Our first foray into this cost of illness type approach was back in about 2008, so this paper published in uh, 2010, as I recall. And so it was economic valuation of the potential health benefits from foods enriched with plant sterols in Canada. At that time, plant sterols were licensed for, uh, for production consumption, introduction into food products in almost every other country in the world, certainly all uh, other well-developed countries, but not Canada. And so there was a group uh, called uh, Council for the uh, Adaptation of Plant Sterols in Canada, something like that, CAPSIC, that uh, some of you would be familiar with that uh, funded some research for us to try to demonstrate that there would be economic health care savings associated with uh, introduction of plant sterols. Of course, subsequently they were uh, allowed to be introduced into food products. But this was the first attempt that we made. Uh, again, Colin Giles, a, a current PhD student of mine being the uh, uh, doing most of the work there with Peter Jones, providing the conceptual oversight of, the prod of that project and most of the ones that we have done subsequently. So as I said, we just wanted to look at what could be done or what there might be in terms of cost savings. So the general approach is to, uh, we've used uh, for most of these, 
We've sort of refined it from a four-step approach to a three-step approach. Basically, we choose a success rate. So based upon the literature, we say, okay, if plant sterols could be introduced, for example, at the time when we did this work, as I said, they weren't, if they could be, how many people would realistically begin to consume products that contain them at the rate necessary to, uh, to affect a, uh, a positive change in cholesterol levels, for example. So you choose a success rate based upon the literature. Um, and I think we ended up with going with uh, Norway or Denmark's rate. I can't remember for sure. I think Norway. So introduce plant sterols into the diet. What associated reduction would there be in, uh, in cholesterol? As a result, what reduction would there be as a result of reduced cholesterol in uh, coronary heart disease in this case? And then finally, the fourth step is to try to uh, try to calculate an economic health care cost savings as a result of the reduced disease state. So we've used this approach or a modification of this approach broadly in subsequent work, and we are looking for ways to refine the approach to make it a little bit more statistically precise from, uh, from say, an econometric standpoint, but that is the, is the general approach. We, at that time, and what we've uh, done subsequently is to say, here's the very best case or ideal scenario, and here's a very worst case or very pessimistic scenario. So I don't want to spend too much time uh, on, on this paper. Uh, the next set of several slides are, are just relating what we've done and what we've done and what we found. And so just to show that we, all of our assumptions were based upon a careful review of the literature. And when we had to make some sort of a leap because we didn't have a good reference to rely upon, we explained it carefully. So the original paper published in Nutrition Reviews back in about 2010. As I said, I think the work commenced in about 2007 or 8. So again, just going through the, uh, the set of steps. So you uh, eat some level of plant sterols should be associated with some reduction in uh, blood cholesterol levels, should lead to a reduction in coronary heart disease, and there will be some healthcare savings associated with that reduction in coronary heart disease. So these numbers are from the Economic Burden of Illness report. When we did this first work, uh, the best numbers available were from 1998. They've since been updated, so subsequent work has relied upon newer numbers. And what we did was just use the uh, Statistics Canada Consumer Price Index uh, healthcare subcategory to update the numbers to, uh, from 1998 numbers to 2000 numbers, so that we had something that made sense in 2007 dollars. So you see, uh, we'll speak, I'll speak later on about uh, different types of direct and indirect, indirect costs. So we, uh, in, the, in the paper that I'll, that I'll focus on a little bit later, that relates to dietary fiber, we sort of have more mortality and morbidity as the main categories of indirect costs. So there are reductions in some types of uh, costs when, say, coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease is reduced, but not others. Fixed costs, we said, don't really decrease because you still have hospitals open, et cetera. You still have doctors working there. But other types of costs could be reduced. So you can look at that paper at your leisure if you're interested in uh, more information on the specific approach. Also, the paper that I'm going to talk about with respect to dietary fiber uh, is in review right now, but if you email me, then I will send it to you. And you note I have strategically failed to provide you with an email address. But it is jared.carlberg at umanitoba.ca for anybody interested in reading the uh, dietary fiber paper in review right now. So we look at proportionately uh, said Really, it's only the variable costs that we, can, uh, that we can affect by these reductions in the short term. So what we're trying to do is take pains not to overstate the, the reductions that could occur. Uh, nobody would value that, and I don't think as scientists we could stand behind it. But I think the numbers that we've uh, come up with in our various works have been reasonable. So again, just looking at the uh, numbers behind the scenario. So remember, step one to... Uh, to to specify a success rate. So all we see there is that in the ideal scenario, 47% of people would consume plant sterols in this case at a level that would, uh, would affect a positive reduction in, in, uh, in, in blood cholesterol levels. So we have four scenarios. 
and you see the, the very pessimistic scenario is indeed pretty bleak and probably unrealistic. So somewhere in between the optimistic and pessimistic scenario, we believe, would be reality, and that is in the 257.5 to $630.4 million annually co healthcare cost reduction range. So what I'm looking for and hoping for is, uh, is some feedback and improvement, potential for improvement on the economic methodology. So as I admitted before, I understand uh, not that much about, uh, about nutrition. I think that I understand that if I eat more fiber, that's good, and less fat, that would be good, and less sugar, that would be very good. But uh, other than that, looking for good feedback on the, on the economic stuff. And so my colleague Peter has uh, actually removed it from the slide deck on several slides yet, what he referred to as a theoretical probability curve. And I think we, uh, I, I teach uh, undergraduate econometrics actually, so my knowledge of statistics is slightly beyond rudimentary, but not much. But I think what he's referring to is a cumulative di distribution function, really, which is to say, we, we come up with four scenarios, but there are literally an infinite number of scenarios. As you all know, the real number line is infinitely divisible. Uh, and so somewhere in here, we can do better with respect to modeling probabilistic outcomes or attaching probabilities to, uh, to levels of healthcare savings, which I think is one of the major uh, improvements that could be undertaken to the economic component of this work. So the uh, theoretical probability curve is no longer overlaid uh, over this stuff. And I was kind of half expecting it when I pushed the next slide button to pop back up and make a liar out of me, but it didn't. The second uh, work, substantial work, that was undertaken at the Richardson Center for Functional Foods and Nutraceuticals, as you see RCFFN there, was uh, Mediterranean Diet Valuation. I wasn't involved in this research, but it worked in largely the same way. So basically looking at uh, what kind of cardiovascular disease reduction could we expect as a, as a result of more people following the Mediterranean diet and what would be the economic cost savings in a healthcare perspective if that occurred. And so this is uh, in press, accepted at Food and Nutrition Research. I believe that's the same journal where our um, where original work on phytosterols was 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 uh, published. So I think that should be available if you're interested in it. I can certainly get it for you. Um, sort of compacting our four-step approach down into three. So a success rate leading to uh, cardiovascular disease reduction again. Numbers based upon uh, reviews of, of largely meta-analyses that have taken place and been published elsewhere. So not numbers that were just uh, sort of made up by the researchers, at least not to my knowledge. So looking again at a, at a, at a four scenario, ideal, optimistic, pessimistic, and very pessimistic or bleak set of outcomes, we said if between five and 50%, or they said if between five and 50%, of the North American populace followed this med diet, you would see the health healthcare savings uh, ideally that, uh, that are represented there. So our most recent work has, uh, has focused on dietary fiber. And so that's the work that I'm uh, wanting to talk the most about today. I know the least about it. So uh, peter.jones at umanitoba.ca if you have questions but uh, focusing on uh, constipation and type 2 diabetes and CBD. The little girl in the slide uh, looks a lot like my daughter. However, she is uh, probably in our house having a dispute with her mother at this time as opposed to being constipated when that expression comes up. And I'm sure many of you uh, are in the same boat. I have four, so my one day stay in Toronto was uh, difficult for my wife, but um, kind of relaxing for me despite the uh, <laughs> despite the spotlight and the threat of having to kiss Vladimir. <laughs> so same approach that we've taken before, um, a success rate to get people up to the level of dietary fiber intake uh, recommended by the IOM, as we'll see in a, uh, the next few slides, leading a, hopefully to a disease reduction and reduced healthcare costs. Uh, constipation, not looking to focus on too much because I'm probably running a little bit short on time. And I think the focus that we're more interested in here is uh, upon diabetes. I note that the conference actually has diabetes in the title and therefore feel compelled to perhaps uh, get to it. 
Uh, this is under review, as I mentioned before, the paper is available for you to look at if you'd like to. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. Uh, Peter will slap me on the wrist when I get back, maybe. But getting then to some of the, uh, some of the numbers that are interesting, uh, focusing on dietary fiber and type 2 diabetes uh, cardiovascular disease. So been associated with uh, lower prevalence of these food-related chronic diseases. Uh, a little bit about where some of the numbers come from. Again, the paper would have more detail on those if you're interested. Uh, getting kind of to the heart of the matter here. So looking at current fiber intake, which is uh, significantly below what are recommended by the IOM, as we see there for men and women of 38 and 25 grams per day respectively. We go through some numbers of uh, incrementally reaching that recommended level of intake. Again, we're looking at uh, doing this using cereal fiber. And so um, we see then the type 2 diabetes reduction per one gram cereal fiber intake and percentage, so a 2.5% reduction for each and a 1.1% reduction for each. You see the references uh, there. So the set of assumptions, if these levels were achieved, we see that um, we would have uh, non-trivial healthcare cost savings of 35.9 to almost 800 million, to almost 800 million in type 2 diabetes costs and 65 to about $1.3 trillion annually reduc reduced in cardiovascular diseases. So the same approach that uh, we've used in the past that I've tried to describe for you today. A set of assumptions, um, we look at scenario analyses which are uh, try to take into account anywhere from ideal scenarios to very pessimistic scenarios and then present for our readers the opportunity to decide what they think is reasonable. And so each one gram per day increase in cereal fiber is, uh, has a pretty significant uh, uh, healthcare cost savings associated with it. So we see for diabetes and type 2 diabetes, sorry, and cardiovascular disease, the numbers up there. Again, more detail in the paper that goes through the assumptions more carefully would, would cite the references for you uh, where the assumptions come from. Looking at, again, just under the four scenarios, and so uh, Dr. Jones in the previous version of this had overlaid, again, the uh, theoretical, pro what he termed the theoretical probability curve. Again, just trying to note what set, uh, what outcome is more likely. So it doesn't do us a whole bunch of good. This gives us a pretty good idea of what might happen financially, but it would be nice to see it associated with, uh, with probabilities. Obviously, the optimistic scenario and the pessimistic scenario have a higher probability of occurring than the very uh, pessimistic or the universal slash ideal scenario. So trying to attach probabilities to it would be a, a statistical improvement, I think, of our work. We see the same information. Um, so type 2 diabetes, and then apparently uh, just for variety, we changed the, the, the format of the chart to get uh, cardiovascular disease. And so <clears throat> again, just to tie everything together, scientists provide uh, health-based uh, health evidence, scientists like yourselves who are mostly nutritionists, doctors, et cetera, uh, real doctors as opposed to doctors like me. And so consumers are therefore responsible for taking into account their, uh, their health states. I think uh, I've, I've somewhat callously at times said, so I, my wife and I and, and, and many of the people here pay a lot of taxes. And more than, so forget about income taxes, add to that sales taxes and all forms of taxes. We pay a lot of taxes. And more than half of those tax dollars go to support health care. So, I think it's sad that people, uh, you know, watching my father die after having a stroke, uh, a lifetime, a lifelong smoker, poor eater in some cases, did have diabetes in 2008 at the age of 73, I guess he was, uh, kind of drove the point home, right, of watching someone kind of lay in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then kick the bucket. So those healthcare states are hard to see. Um, families suffer, people suffer, businesses suffer because they deal with, uh, with morbidity they deal with turnover costs, it's uh, quite gross. But as a taxpayer, forget about all the, all the other stuff. So if I'm a cyborg just paying taxes, which is how it feels someday, uh, some days, that's what I'm interested in. So maybe my family paid $40,000 in taxes last year and 25 or $22,000 of it was healthcare costs. It'd be kind of nice if that was 
like $38,000 and $20,000 of it were healthcare costs. So those, those are the interesting parts from an economist standpoint. Uh, but the personal health outcomes are interesting from everybody's standpoint, I think, because even though we do discount those future health states, uh, they are coming. And I think that I'm not much of an interventionalist when it comes to regulatory affairs. Now, many of you are in the field of healthcare and nutrition, and so it is necessary. There was a good reason, probably, why the Canadian government took longer than everybody else in the world to license plant sterols, but they're careful. Food is important. Um, I'm not much of an interventionalist, but I think that it's a, it's a call to order for governments to look from a regulatory standpoint at more carefully regulating. Um, small items are things like nutrition labeling requirements. So Center for the Study of uh, Center for the Study of Science and the Public Interest (CSPI) that some of you will know here in Canada um, has been on the war path with respect to sodium for some time. So. That's good edu public education uh, campaigns that focus on doctors because they're the ones seeing people on a day-to-day -day basis uh, are good outright bans. I'm not much of an interventionalist, but if we can make people healthier and if we can save uh, lives and if we can most importantly reduce my tax bill, then I'm in favor of it. And so I think that the unique structure of how healthcare is funded here in Canada and the unique structure that we have, especially in pockets with respect to uh, certain demographic groups, it, it could be it could be a winner, and so our re line of research has merely been to try to start to uh, have the conversation about there are real savings to be out there and uh, to to be realized, and let's start that. And so I'll get to my I'm seeing I'm getting the the evil eye here from my uh, chairs, both, and we are uh, now done, and so I think I've kind of covered off my. Uh, what I wanted to say in the summary slides. So we could, uh, we could do a little better. We could reduce my tax bill and yours. We could save some lives. Um, our research is merely just to try to point that out. I'm very keen to receive any suggestions you have for improvements uh, in the methodology from an economic standpoint. I'm sure Dr. Jones is as keen to receive your suggestions on any uh, criticisms or observations you might have about the nutrition side of things. So again, any questions or requests for this, any of the papers that I've cited today, uh, jared.carlberg at umanitoba.ca and the spelling of my name can be found in the program. In the days before we realized the true potential of decrease in health, uh, decrease in disease from consuming dietary fiber, the UK made an estimation uh, of the costs of uh, adding dietary fibre to the diet. And the overwhelming cost which they thought, and I hate to say this because I don't want to um, spoil the approach to increasing dietary fibre intake, but you may well have evidence. Um, the amount of money spent on, on sewage works had to go up, and that was a bit of an inhibition. <laughs> <laughs> what other sorts of costs are there which would make the sponge be one where the savings will not be those that predicted by, 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 uh, by the healthcare costs? So that's a very good question. And I think that as we try to refine uh, and make our approach more sophisticated, we would have to look at, uh, at that. that's a good example of in infrastructure costs. We think that the, uh, for some types of it, we, we're not advocating that there would be a public expenditure to help with uh, increased fiber in intake. But there are related costs that, that you identify. We also think it's possible that we haven't captured all of the private sector, um, the private sector cost savings that could occur with, from reduced morbidity and mortality. So I think uh, that's, an, that's an excellent suggestion. And as we continue to improve the economics behind the work, we certainly have to take those things into account. I just uh, was looking that up uh, this morning, and uh, I found that uh, actually there was a reduction in cost uh, in the UK for that um, for for an increase in fiber consumption. And there was a uh, there is a paper cost savings of reduced constipation rates attributed to increased dietary fiber intakes in uh, in Europe, and that cost saving was um, uh, 127 million pounds in the United Kingdom. Um, that, that this seems to be work from Kellogg's Europe um, as well. Um, 
So if we can save 200 million in Canada just with uh, di in diabetes, is that correct? Then maybe this is probably equivalent to another a bit more than 200,000, 200 million um, Canadian dollar, if uh, this is true for Canada as well. Maybe the sewage problem is not such a big problem. <laughs> well, the, 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 the point is that uh, a very, very careful accounting of all costs must be undertaken in order for the results to be, to be reliable and to be useful in the public discourse. Thank you. We have Furio Briganti for the University of Parma. We don't have Furio. <laughs> yes, we have. We do have. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. I was just <clears throat> making a comment, uh, maybe asking you a, a feedback on this comment, about the, uh, I'm a bit scared, a bit worried about the putting economy in healthcare in a, in a strong way. Um, because there are many, many variables that should be considered a part of the cost of care. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to be facing a day the fact that by prolonging the life of a very elderly population would cost in terms of support for retirement funding for, uh, for longer. So that is a, is a very big cost that should be taken into account and in my opinion uh, the whole idea to apply just uh, economic modeling in, in healthcare uh, is a bit scary on that. Mm -hmm. And the second question is <clears throat> how it fits into a, an economic way of interpreting nutrition the cost of the impact on the environment. No? So we, know all, we all know that we, we should eat more fish, for example, but fish is a, no, is a resource which is already on the, on the edge to be no? Uh, to be completely right. exhausted. Uh, and again, we should make some consideration about the, the fat sources no? and, the, and the productivity of, 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 of the fat sources which are now present in the world and that will be forecast in, in a few years when we will be nine billion people living in the earth. So it, it's something which is very, very complex. It goes well behind, in my opinion, uh, from the data that you present here, which is only related to cost of care. Very good. Just quick answer, please, or comment. Do you want to comment? Yeah, thank you very much, sir. I, I like the way you think you would make a fine economist. Um, if we keep people alive longer, then we'll just have to pay for them. Please let them die. Now, I'm paraphrasing and just, I know that's not what you meant, but, but again, it does uh, come to the same point as my colleague, uh, which is that uh, a more careful accounting of all of the costs is, is in order. But very good observations. Thank you. I know we have much more questions, but we have in order to save time. John is waving there. Uh, we have to kind of finish. And thanks a lot. Wonderful talk and great questions. Yeah.